Good morning, good morning. As the offering is being passed around, just as a reminder, please sign up for the thank you meal for Elder uh, Billy and his wonderful wife, Delora. They will be leaving us. Uh, the, the meal is going to be next Sunday, and we do need you to register so that way we can cook the proper amount of food. And then after service, uh, Mr. Sam Haney is going to be making an announcement about the yard sale that will be taking place here on church property next Saturday. Next Saturday. So um, good morning to you. It is good to be here and have the opportunity to speak to you again. Uh, I am glad to see all of your faces looking uh, back up at me. And we are in our second sermon for our series on journey. Um, We are on a journey here at Severn Christian Church, and we are doing a six-week sermon series on where we are going as a church. What are the goals that we want to accomplish? If you were here last week, we talked about the journey of seeing, how it's important to cast a vision, how it's important to uh, look towards the future, to discuss where we are going to go as a church family, as an individual Christian, or even just as your own individual families. It's always important to set goals um, and to hope that you can accomplish those goals. Today, we're going to be talking about the journey of leading right? The journey of leading. I don't know if you've ever been on a journey where there's no one leading the trip, but it's probably would be one of the most confusing, disastrous trips that you could ever imagine. I mean, just think about it. Trying to plan out a journey somewhere, and nobody takes the leadership to decide where you're going to go or what you're going to do. Now, I don't know about all you husbands out there or um, you teenagers, but my wife, she plans the journeys for us. She's very detail-oriented. She'll plan where we're going to go, how much it's going to cost, and it's really quite relaxing for me because <laughs> I don't have to worry about anything, right? And she, she is sure to tell me that. You know, Rick, you don't have to worry about nothing. You just enjoy the trip. And I'm like, that's right. I just enjoy the trip. But she's good. She finds the deals, the discounts whenever we take vacations or whatever, and she's awesome about planning uh, journeys. But when, when we talk about the journey of the church, right, the primary responsibility To plan the journey of the church is not necessarily the leadership here. It's not necessarily Christians that are sitting in the pews. The primary responsibility for the journey of the church is Jesus Christ. He is the one who lays out for us where we should go and what we should do. Um, But we did talk about last week how the leadership here, um, whether you're an elder or a minister, evangelist, or a deacon, um, a teacher, a ministry leader, how it's important for us to take the liberty in Christ that we have and use creative platforms to share the gospel and accomplish Jesus' mission. Um, you know, this week was, it was joyful for me because, you know, when I think about my own personal walk, my own personal journey with Jesus, him calling me into actual church leadership, um, I thought about, and I'll never forget this memory, I can remember the moment that it, it changed for me. I was sitting in a two-bedroom apartment. My mom had to get extra income for our family, so she decided to do traveling medical work. And so I went to school um, as a high schooler. I played football. I worked um, a part-time job, 25 hours a week. And I pretty much, my junior and senior year, I pretty much raised myself. I went to school on time. I went to work on time. I was the captain of, of the football team. And I remember that God had been using and, and, and working in my life Uh, different key moments. My father passing away left a huge open door for God to to work through me and really convict my heart about certain things. It it exposed me to some things that I wouldn't have been exposed to if that tragedy didn't happen. And I can remember going to an at-home Bible study with a guy named Nick Martin. He was the quarterback of our football team. And at that Bible study, um, I was just convicted that God wanted to do a lot with my life. And, and so I was at home, and I was reading through my Bible. I just became obsessed and addicted to reading the Bible. And I remember just feeling so just overwhelmed and convicted that God wanted to use me. And I was reading through Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. If you know anything about the book of Isaiah, you'll know that Israel was in a lot of trouble. It was about 700 B.C., and they were making decisions that were completely anti-God. They decided to formulate their structure as a nation around materialism, sex, idol worship, uh, false teaching, false preaching. It really became an egocentric type of nation. This nation should serve my purposes. And you've got this guy named Isaiah who's a spiritual leader in in the kingdom then, and he's a prophet. And all of a sudden, he gets a vision. And he sees the Lord Almighty, and he sees seraphims. I don't know if you know what seraphims are, but a lot of people think angels have wings, right? 
Angels in the Bible do not have wings. They are called sons of God. They look and act a lot like us. But the, the angelic beings, if you will, that do have wings are seraphims and cherubims. I like cherubims because they're little babies. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but they're like little, little chubby. I picture like little chubby babies, but that's the image that the Old Testament gives. And they have two wings, and they're super powerful. Like they are really, really powerful in the Old Testament. But seraphim, they have six wings. Two cover their feet two cover their face, and then two they use to fly with. I, I don't know. Maybe once I get to heaven, I'll ask God, dude, why'd you, why'd you choose six wings? So that's what he chose. Anyway, so he sees, Isaiah sees God, and immediately, immediately he is convicted of his own personal sin. And he says, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. Immediately he senses his own sin in the presence of God. And I think it's interesting that whenever we lose focus of our own sins, or our own shortcomings as leaders in our families, in our schools, in our jobs, especially in the church, whenever we lose focus of our own sins, it's probably because God's presence is, is gone. When God's presence is in our life and we're reading his word, we will be humble. We will recognize that we have baggage. We mess up. We make mistakes. And Isaiah, when he comes into the presence of God, immediately he experiences this conviction. But remember, Isaiah is in a nation that desperately needs God. But here's the thing. God does not work outside of men being his method. In other words, God doesn't convict nations. God doesn't move mountains. God doesn't impart faith without using people. And so God asked this question, and I was reading through this. God asked this question in Isaiah 6. He says, who should go for me, Isaiah? Who will I send? And Isaiah cries out, he says, here I am, Lord, send me. You see, what was unique about Isaiah is that when he was confronted with his sin, he confessed. He understood, he recognized his own lack of understanding, his own lack of holiness, his own lack of being used by God. But the difference between Isaiah and the rest of Israel is that Isaiah was willing to be used. And it was in this moment that I was reading through Isaiah that I just became overwhelmingly convicted of my own sin my own unrighteousness, my own shortcomings. And, and I can remember, I remember sitting there at the, at, the, at the table. I got from the table. I fell on my knees. I was crying. I was convicted. I was moved. And I said, God, if you will so choose to use me, here I am, send me. And I really think that is a, an aspect of leadership that we all should have is some form of humility. And I'll be quite honest with you. And going over this message, I, I kind of felt those same things again. That who am I really to teach about leadership? Who am I really to, to teach about what it's like to lead the church? I have a lot that I have to learn. There is so much scripture and understanding about God's word that I, that I just don't know. There are so many sins that I struggle with on a daily um, operation in my own mind. And I, can just, I just feel so inadequate at times to be used and to be led by God. But I want to be used by him. And I hope that you do too. And I think that that can be the common denominator of making Severn Christian Church the best that she can be, is that even though we don't have it all together, even though we mess up and make mistakes, if we are willing to be used by God and let him use our imperfections, God can do great things. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, about what it's like to be a sold-out leader for Jesus what it's like to be a sold-out leader for Jesus. You know, whenever Jesus talked about the kingdom or being used by God, it was always number one. Number one, above your family. Number one, above your job. Number one, above your own curricular activities that you like to do. Number one, above yourself. He said things like this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness. An example that he gave was like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field that you would sell everything in order to buy that field. Everything. Can you imagine finding some ragtag field out in Severn, Maryland, or Glen Burnie, and understanding that, wow, there's this great treasure there. I'm selling it all. I don't care what I have to sell. I'm selling it all, and I'm buying that field. Another example that Jesus gave was the kingdom is like a pearl, right? You have pearl merchants who get down into the ocean, and they find clams, and they open up, and they get pearls. It's like this, that there's this pearl, and you would be willing to sell everything as a pearl merchant. Your, your boat, your nets, your knives, your house, whatever it is, you'd be willing to sell it in order to buy this pearl. 
Um, there is a modern example uh, to illustrate it once more. I don't know if you heard about this, but this lady lost her ring in the trash, right? She lo- I got a picture. It should pop up for you. She lost her ring in the trash. It was a 12.5 carat ring. The band was worth over $500,000 right? You can only imagine, like, I panic when I lose my phone or my keys. <laughs> I can't imagine losing a $500,000 ring. Well, this, this ring was in her family. She wanted to pass it down to her daughter. Not only did it have a lot of physical material value, but there was a lot of sentimental value in it as well. And so she immediately realized, where's my ring? I don't have it. And her husband realized the night before Um, he was cleaning the countertops and he grabbed up some paper towels that were on the counter and he threw it in the trash. Well, trash day was the next day. The garbage was gone and she didn't have her ring, right? So you can imagine the panic that she's going through at this moment. So she decides, you know what, I don't care. I'm going to try to find this ring. And she calls up the, um, the garbage management, and the garbage had already been taken to the dump, and there were over nine tons of trash, nine tons of trash. And as she's talking to the garbage manager, he decides, you know what, it's like finding a needle in a haystack, but I am here. I- I'll go out, and I'll try to help her. Uh, I'll be willing to dig through the garbage to try to find this, this diamond ring for her. So he goes out, and they're digging through the garbage, and over nine tons of trash, he recognizes a piece of paper that's, um, that has her address on it, and they find the ring, dude. They find the ring. Can you imagine? Like, wow, how awesome is that? And so she was over-elated, super excited. I don't know if she gave the guy any money, um, but dude, I mean, I totally would give him money, you know, for doing something like that. I mean, that's awesome, but that's, that's leadership. You're willing to dig through the trash. You're willing to dig through the messiness of life, saying, here I am to be used, because that's how important this thing is. And that's what, it, what we're talking about this morning, that we are all leaders in this room. Whether or not you recognize that, you are a leader in some capacity, either in your family, at your job, in the church. Hopefully, everyone, one day, we can be leaders in the church, Uh, on sports teams, whatever it is, we all are leaders. The question is, is whether or not we're good leaders. The question is, how do we lead in our capacity? Are we willing to be used by God on those divine ordained platforms that God has so richly blessed us with in order to share the gospel? We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. This is going to be uh, the kind of the text that we're going to go through. And really, Ephesians is about unity. Uh, the book of Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul around 52 AD, and, um, and he's writing to a group of people who need to be unified, and the main theme is in Christ. In Christ, we are unified. In Christ, we are predestined. In Christ, God has chosen to, sa- to save us. And when he gets to the subject of, of Ephesians chapter 4, he unifies it by saying, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. One God and Father who is above all and in all. And, and then he talks about Jesus being uh, the ruler and the king and the conqueror. And he gets to this subject of leadership. And so if you'll follow along with me in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 16, we're going to go down through this this morning. Paul writes this. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, who by the way are done away with. We don't have apostles and prophets today. The evangelists, that's what I am. The pastors and teachers, um, which are one office, it's the elders of the church. You'll hear terms like bishop, pastor, elder, overseer. Those are all synonymous terms for the same position in the church. Now notice that they are gifts. They are gifts given. Now what kind of snot-nosed little brat would get a gift and say, no, I don't want it. No, that's not good enough for me, right? You guys know anybody like that? I'm sure you you have, maybe some spoiled kids. This is exactly what I did not want, mom and dad. (laughs) I mean, oh man, it just drives me crazy when I see people who are ungrateful. It drives me insane. And you know why? Because sometimes I'm ungrateful, and it's true. Uh, It's true. So sometimes we don't like the things that, uh, that, you know, reflects us. But he says in verse 12, he says, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's Son so that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full, complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth. 
Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. You see, Jesus is in charge. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What I'm going to speak about this morning are some qualities of leadership so that we all can become like leaders in God's kingdom. As I said, everyone here is a leader. And what I want to do is go through four things to make you a solid leader in whatever capacity that God has placed you in. And while these definitely apply to leaders in the church, they most certainly apply to you as well. And so we should all be striving for these leadership qualities. The first thing that I want to take a look at this morning, and if you have your fill in the blanks, go ahead and write this in. The number one thing that he starts out with, I think, are leaders are supportive right? Leaders are thankful. Leaders are supportive. Leaders show appreciation. As I said, can you imagine getting a gift from somebody and then turning your nose up at it? This person probably sacrificed a lot to get this thing for you. And one of the aspects of leadership is that we need to be supportive of those leading in the church, whether they are elders or ministers or Sunday school teachers, or ministry leaders, whatever capacity that people are leading in the church, we should be supportive. That's the first S of what it means to be solid. You see, Jesus appointed certain positions in the church to accomplish his mission here for the church in the world. These are set up by Jesus to do his work. We should view our leaders as gifts, though, not gods. They are voluntary servants. They are not lords. They are not kings. They are not uh, cardinals or popes. They are certainly servant leaders. A key quality of leadership is realizing that you are here to give support, which stems from a heart of thankfulness. If you are going to be a supportive leader, it's because you are a thankful person. I want you to think of it like this, right? Picture um, if you are in a relationship, say a marriage, for instance. When you stop giving thanks for the small things, when you stop giving thanks for the clean house, the clean clothes, the laundry that's done, the, the meals that are cooked, the income that is made, when you stop giving thanks for that, you no longer feel supported. You no longer feel valuable. You no longer feel like people actually appreciate what you do. And when you give thanks, right, through a word of appreciation, through a small gift. Wow, how supportive do you feel? I mean, there's nothing better as a husband when I wake up and I take care of Piper and I do the, uh, the laundry and wash the dishes and Angel comes down and she gives me a big hug and a kiss and she says, thank you. I'm a words of affirmation guy, right? So the way that I receive love and appreciation is when you tell me things. Um, I'm also a physical touch, giving hugs, handshakes, high fives. Those are all ways that I uh, receive love. And so when she shows me that type of appreciation, I feel supported as a husband. What's well, the same thing for her? When I tell her, thank you for being such a good mom. Thank you for sacrificing uh, by putting Piper to bed every single night. Thank you for being, being willing to work and help provide for our family. When I show Angel appreciation, when I thank her, she feels supported as, as a wife, as a mom. And it's the same thing in leadership. As leaders, right, me, I should be a leader and showing support for people in the church. But it also works the same way. Uh, as, as leaders in your homes and in your families, you should be showing support, not only for the leadership, but for the people that you're surrounded with. Support simply means this, to encourage, to provide additional help. This could be emotionally, it could be spiritually, it could be financially. And why should we support these people, right? Why should we support each other? Um, what should we support? These are all questions that we're going to ask, but we need to support good, solid teaching. Whenever somebody delivers a good message, whenever somebody sacrifices their time to do a Wednesday night barbecue, um, Bible study, or to teach a Sunday school class, walk up and say thanks. Show them some support. When everybody, whenever somebody lives a good life, an example of faith, thank you for being such a good role model to our kids. Thank you for being such a good leader to our family and our community, showing people appreciation for working hard and, and getting up and coming to church and sacrificing your time. Those are things that we can be thankful for. We should be a good example to the people around us. The Hebrew writer put it like this. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, he says this, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow their example. 
when you have in the forefront of your mind what people have done for you in your life, it's hard not to be a thankful person. When you look back over your life and you see what people have sacrificed and done to help you out in life, especially when it comes to leaders in your family or leaders at your job, but in the context, leaders of the church, it should cause us to be thankful, thankful for what they've done for us. Now, why should we do that? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Jesus says to do it, right? Support your leaders. Remember what they do. Be thankful. You know, being in a leadership is hard. It, 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 is, it is difficult because you are in a limelight that other people aren't in. You are held to a higher standard that other people aren't held to. You fathers who are, are Christian leaders of your family, you got to be different. You're under, you're under the limelight. What you teach your children, the example that you set, moms, the same thing. You Christian leaders in schools and on college campuses, you guys are under the limelight. What you teach, the Bible says, um, will be judged more strictly. In fact, in the context of elders... If an elder is caught in sin, he is to be brought before the church and rebuked before all, it says in Timothy, so that all can learn. I mean, can you imagine living under that type of pressure to know if you mess up in a major moral or doctrinal way, you could be brought before the church and exposed and and rebuked before all? That would be a pretty tough thing to live under, right? That's why people who step up to be elders in the church, it says they desire uh, an honorable office. It is an honorable thing to put yourself under that type of pressure, to step up to that type of challenge. But the cool thing about elders is they don't claim to be perfect, but they want to be used by God. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Let me be used by you in your kingdom. And that's really what, what we want. That's really what God wants you to do. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Right? If you had the perfect leader, what would that person do? Right? If you had the perfect leader, what would that person do? What would be the qualities or characteristics that that person would have? I wrote down a couple, right? An educated student of God's word. I wrote down morally obedient, courageous in dealing with conflict, the spiritual leader of the family, a prayer warrior, a protector of the church against false doctrine self-disciplined, a good communicator, strategic in evangelism, relational, trustworthy, dependable. I mean, these are a lot of things that we would want in a good leader. And you know what's funny? When I decided to become a minister, I had no clue what the ministry actually had in store. I thought all I was going to be doing was teaching people. And um, Toby could probably attest to this, that uh, Toby Graff, he um, is in the ministry for a good long while. He's a minister here at Seven Christian Church. That when you're, you become a minister, you soon realize that all of a sudden you're a construction worker. <laughs> you're a cleaner. <laughs> you have to be an expert in youth ministry and what it's like dealing with early childhood development. Uh, you also have to wear another hat of what it's like to be an outreach minister into the community. You've got to be a strategic planner, what it's like to plan events, take kids on trips. I mean, there is a lot of things that I didn't realize that I would be doing in youth ministry. I'm an artist, I'm a construction worker, I'm a teacher, and the list goes on and on and on. But um, I don't know why I brought that up to you, uh, just off the top of my head. Anyways, so we're talking about what you would want in a good leader, right? If these are the things that we want in good leaders... Are we willing to show our appreciation and our thankfulness for what they do, right? If you want to encourage good behavior in your kids, what better way than to encourage and thank the good things that they do? It's called positive reinforcement. So here's our key phrase. Being a supportive leader in the church stems from the spirit of thankfulness. It stems from the spirit of thankfulness. I can remember one of my most favorite things uh, was getting together with our family um, in Ohio. My grandpa owned like a farm and he built his own house. My grandfather was a construction worker and uh, I was left-handed so I was never good at doing construction. Uh, He would always make fun of me for it. For whatever reason, people who are left-handed just can't hammer a a nail. I don't know why. I'm sitting there hammering. I would go through like 10 nails trying to help him build something and he just comes over and like two whacks and it's in. I'm like, what gives? Whatever. I'm 12 years old. Give me a break. You know what I'm saying? But anyways, I know. Uh, I don't know. It's weird. So anyways, um, getting together for holidays, you know, we would decide to cook a meal and everybody's in the kitchen. I mean, you're talking about like 30 people because my uncle had seven kids with his wife and then my Aunt Melanie, she had four kids with her husband and then my mom and my sister, my grandparents. So all the cousins are there and everybody's in the kitchen and everybody wants to help. 
right? I'm on the potatoes, somebody's doing eggs, the other person's working on the, the meat, putting it in the oven, and everybody's in the kitchen being together. And if you're not doing anything, you kind of have this sense of like, I'm not really contributing, you know? But so you still want to be involved, so you stand in there and you're like giving people emotional support, like, man, you really peel that potato awesome, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you're having fun and you're eating stuff. Well, that's like my favorite thing to do when Angel makes deviled eggs, you know, I'll, I'll be the tester. And it's like one every 10 seconds, and I just pop them in. Next thing you know, she's got like 12. She made 24. No shame in my game, you know what I'm saying? And uh, anyway, so you're just happy to be there. You're thankful to be there. So contributing really isn't a big issue. You're not like, oh, I have to do this, because you're happy to be in the family. And that's what it is when it comes to leadership, is that you will be supportive. You will contribute because you're happy to be there. You're part of the family. I can remember one time, my grandfather, for whatever reason, uh, just a few years ago, he got cows. He's like 80, right? And so he gets cows, and um, he builds this fence. My grandpa's funny. He, like, built a random pond, and then <laughs> it didn't even hold water. And then he got horses, and then he gets cows. He does a lot of crazy stuff. I just think he just bought, like, I guess 30 cars because he wants to be a used car salesman now. He's just one of those guys who just doesn't stop, right? And uh, it's so funny. You're like, dude, man, you worked all your life. Take a chill pill. You know what I mean? Go fishing or something like that. Uh, anyway, so his cow gets loose, and we are all there, right? And my grandfather immediately goes outside because, you know, doesn't want the cow to get, a cow will wreck your car. My cousin hit a cow, destroyed her car. A cow was fine. Anyways... So we are all outside, my mom, my grandfather, my grandma, uh, myself, Angel, we are all outside trying to get this cow back. Um, it didn't even cross our mind not to help, not to be supportive. And it stems from the heart of being thankful, of being part of the family. And that's one of the, the most wonderful things about church leadership is that you're really thankful for what Jesus did for you. And so you just feel obligated. You feel obligated to give back. And so that's our next point. Before we get to that point, I want to read you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where Paul writes this, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live at peace with one another. Show appreciation. Thank people who lead in the church. If you go pick up your kids that are getting taught, trust me, it is, it is a sacrifice to not be able to be in here and, and hear a message and worship with song, and they're there teaching your kids. Thank them when you go pick up your kids today, or when you go pick up your kids from junior church, or when you come on Wednesday night, or maybe next small group that you have. Small groups are getting ready to end. Thank the person that takes the time to open up their home and sacrifice their time to help lead spiritually. Give thanks to them. I want you to picture it like this, right? One of my favorite arcade games was Cruising USA. Anybody? Anybody? Come on now. You liars. Whatever. Yeah, Cruising USA was awesome, and you know it, right? They had Cruising World and Cruising USA. I was a Cruising USA guy. And you go there, and you, you would race. And what's cool about Cruising USA is, uh, is that if you won, you get to keep racing, right? So I would go there with a, with a roll of quarters. You know, we'd go to the movies or, or the arcade in the mall. They used to have arcades in malls, by the way. And, uh, and so I would, you know, pop in a quarter, and I would just sit there at the Cruisin' USA machine as long as possible. And if I, if I didn't win, I'd pop another quarter in, and I would just drive my little heart out. I love to get the big truck and go over the ramps. One of my favorite maps was, like, California with the huge trees. I know you guys don't know what I'm talking about because, like, one person raised hand. Anyways, it was super fun. It was a racing game, right? I want you to picture it like this that your appreciation, your support, is like having an unlimited roll of quarters, that you can deposit however many quarters that you want in a person's life. It is unlimited. You never run out. And some of us, we walk around with our pockets full of quarters, and we're not depositing thankfulness in people's lives. And that's something that we should be doing. Because leaders have responsibility. They have what our next fill in the blank is. They have obligations, right? To be obligated. Their mind is aware of their responsibility. Parents certainly know this. Teachers certainly know this. Leaders in the church, business owners, uh, military commanders, you, you have this sense of responsibility, this obligation. It's not an option. You have to be there. Your children are depending upon you. Your employees are depending upon you. Paul wrote it like this in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. If God has given you leadership ability, take that responsibility seriously. 
take your leadership responsibility seriously. God has placed you in your schools for a reason. You are a leader. You are a light. You are sitting on a hill. Take that opportunity seriously. God has placed you in your job for a reason. God has put you in your family for a reason. God has put you in this church for a reason. Take that responsibility seriously. It means to be enthusiastic. It means to uh, give it your best or be zealous. You know, we live in a world of broken promises. For instance, you want to get a divorce? Easy. Just go get a lawyer. Quick and easy, painless. Just pay a few bucks and you're good to go. I mean, there's advertisements all over the place if you want a quick and easy divorce. Think about this, church membership. You got a problem with the church? Just transfer to the church down the street. There's no big deal. Who cares about the promise or obligation that you made? You need to find a place that makes you happy, which is true. You need to find a place that makes you happy, but not at the cost of breaking your promise. You need to have a marriage that makes you happy, but not at the cost of breaking your promise. How about families? A lot of families today, not people in this room, I do not believe, but there are a lot of families who rely on the government to raise their children. Well, the school will take care of educating my child. Uh, the government will take care of paying for my kids' health insurance. These are all things that people rely on the government for, but we have a responsibility. Contracts, right? There's always a good reason why the contract you signed should not be kept, uh, whether it's credit cards or membership somewhere, uh, or if you sign up at a gym membership, well, I don't like the gym and what they have to offer. I'm going to break my promise. What does that say about us? Think about politicians, right? It's the same old game every time, empty, void promises. They beat the drum, they say the promises, and then rarely do they ever follow through. And there's always some really good reason as why they can't follow through. We are saturated with a world of broken promises. I am an imperfect husband. I make a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of shortcomings, a lot of failures. But my heart, my heart to my obligation is true. And even though I might not be the perfect husband, Angel has my heart. I will never leave her or forsake her. I will keep my promise to love her and honor her. And I will never leave her until I die. And although I mess up, I am going to keep my promise because that defines who I am. Think about the imperfect Christian. This is why repentance is so important. Do we all make mistakes? Absolutely we make mistakes. Do we all have shortcomings? We certainly do. In fact, we've talked about this before, putting a sign out on the church, only imperfect people allowed, right? We all make mistakes, but where is your heart? We all have an obligation to the kingdom. We all have a responsibility. And that's exactly what Paul says in Ephesians chapter four. Look at verse 12. He says, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and the knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we won't be tossed to and fro like immature children. We won't be blown away by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. True leadership is teaching people to be self-sufficient, to be active, to not have to say, remember, this is your responsibility. Remember, this is what you're supposed to do. Remember dads, remember moms, remember church leaders, remember employees and bosses. True leadership stems from an obligation that we have a responsibility. And what are the responsibilities? Well, he says two things that we're gonna go through quickly. Number one is to equip God's people to do his work. I think one of the hardest things to overcome is that the Americanized church has this idea that the minister or the church leaders should do it all, right? But the Bible's very clear. The responsibility of the leadership is to equip the people to do the work of Jesus, not do the work for them. Uh, he also says, I want you to teach them so that they won't be tossed around like immature infants who don't know what the truth is. You know, um, I would love to have a church I would love to have a church where I am not the only, pe the only person baptizing people, or Clyde is not the only person baptizing people. I think it's the most glorious thing when a father baptizes his son or daughter. I think it's awesome when a mom baptizes uh, her, her children or maybe her sister. I mean, what a powerful testimony that people are fulfilling their obligation to the Lord, that they are sharing the gospel message. What a powerful thing. And that's something that we should be doing, taking the initiative to share the message of Jesus with people. That is true leadership. And he says, I want you to build the church. And I take that in a couple ways. Number one, build the church numerically. 
God is concerned about numbers. 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost. 5,000, not counting women and children, were saved at the preaching of Peter and John in Acts 3 through 5. I mean, wow, that's awesome. God wants us to win souls to him. He wants everyone to be saved, but also to build up the church spiritually, to teach them inner spiritual growth and scriptural understanding and spiritual discernment. Uh, discernment. God wants us to grow spiritually. We have to be obligated. And the illustration he gave is a full man. Now, I have another picture up here that should be there. Has anybody ever seen Mad TV Stewart? Yes, right? No! That's what he would do, and he'd stick his foot up in everybody's face. <laughs> it's so funny. He's this grown man who wears diapers and, and underwear, and he's just like a little kid, right? So he's got this man's body, but he acts like a little child. He wears this uh, makeup, and it is absolutely hilarious. His mom on the show is equally hilarious. If you go to YouTube, just look at YouTube, type in and watch some videos, and do yourself a favor. You'll have a really enjoyable time. Don't spend too much time on it, though. It can consume your life, okay? I'm not speaking from experience, of course. <clears throat> not speaking from experience. But here's the thing. Stuart is a full-grown man, but he acts like a child, right? God wants us, when he says be a full-grown man, um, he's giving us this picture of maturity, right? This developed nature to where you are a mature person. He wants you to be mature in the Lord and a very sinful culture. In other words, he wants you to sift through the culture, not soak it in. He wants you to measure up to what Jesus has for you in your life and for your family, right? If we have an obligation, we have to take it seriously. If we make a promise to God, I will follow you. If we make a promise to be members at a church, if we make promises to our wives and to our families, we need to keep them. We need to take it seriously. Ecclesiastes put it like this when Solomon wrote this. He said, when you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through, for God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make. It is better to say nothing than to make a promise and not keep it. And so here's our key phase is that taking your obligation seriously means keeping your promise to Christ and the local church. Keeping your promise to Christ and the local church. Now, because of time, we're going to cover these last two points very quickly. Number three, leaders are loving. Leaders are loving. Paul says, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth and love. If we are going to really lead our families, we have to be able to say the truth, but present it in such a way that it is loving, right? A lot of people say, well, I just tell it like it is. No, that is not what Christ wants you to do. He doesn't want you to tell it like it is. He doesn't want you to just speak your mind. He wants you to communicate in such a way that people can handle it, right? How would you want it communicated to you is probably a good role for how you should communicate to the people around you. Notice Paul didn't say, speak your opinion. Notice Paul didn't say, speak your preference, speak your wants, but speak the truth. And when it comes to matters like the origin of man, abortion, same-sex marriage, logic, sex, marriage, uh, when it comes to money, we have to, as Christians, be able to speak the truth, but declare it in such a way that it is loving, that people can handle it. Let the truth be the reason they reject what you say, not the way in which you communicate. Do not give it watered down, right? You can't just speak things in love. If it's not truthful, then what's the whole point? But at the same time, it really, we really have to be able to speak the truth in love because love conveys the idea that you actually care. It conveys the idea that you actually care. One of the most toughest discussions I've ever had, I worked a part-time job at the last church that I was at, and this young lady was coming to church, um, and she wanted to be baptized, but she had a problem. Her problem was is that two years ago, um, she had lost a very close friend in a car accident. Uh, her friend was driving in a truck down the road, fell asleep at the wheel, and died three days later. And she, they were like sisters growing up. And she wanted to get baptized and become a Christian, but she knew she knew that getting baptized placed judgment on her unbaptized friend. She knew that claiming to follow Jesus placed some form of judgment on her friend who wasn't a Christ follower. And so I was talking with her, and I said, you know, um, my father, uh, he kind of drifted away from the church, and he was baptized in the Christian church, uh, but, um, you know, he left the church. And about six months before he died, uh, he decided to, to go back to church and, you know, keep the Lord's covenant. And I said, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure if he's in heaven or not. 
And I opened up the Bible to Luke chapter 16 where it talks about the rich man and Lazarus and how the rich man had all that life had to offer. And when he died, uh, he went to Hades. He went to the waiting place uh, because he didn't get to go to paradise because he wasn't a very good person. He didn't follow God. He didn't obey God's rules. And so, um, and so he cried out to Abraham. He saw Abraham up in paradise and he said, Abraham, please send somebody to tell my brothers not to come to this place. His only concern was not that hell is a party. It's not that he wanted his brothers there. His only concern in that moment was hoping that somebody would share the message with his brothers, his five brothers. And Abraham said, they have God's word. You had God's word and you chose to reject it. They have the same thing. And I said, I was telling her, I said, you know, I'm not sure where your friend is. I said, but God is just. God is going to do the right thing and you can trust that. I said, but no matter where she is, you can be rest assured of one thing. She would be uh, so very happy to know that you're having this conversation with me right now. And wherever she is, she would be pleading with you, follow Jesus. And so I had to speak in such a way that I could communicate the truth to her, but also present it in a way that, is, that was loving, how she could accept it, how she could tolerate it. I let the gospel take the heat, not myself. So we must speak the truth in love, not out of anger. Um, So here's the key phrase for this, is that leadership is not about control, it's about service and guidance. It's not about winning an argument or proving everyone wrong, it's about caring about people to serve and love them by speaking the truth. And here's our fourth and final point this morning, is that leaders are devoted. Be a solid leader, be a sold out leader. Leaders are supportive, leaders are obligated, leaders are loving, and leaders are devoted. He says this in verse 16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This point is so very important. If everyone is doing their part, the body will grow. Be devoted to do what God has called you to do. Be devoted to being a doer. If everybody in this room that I'm looking at right now is doing their part in the kingdom, the body of Christ will grow. That is what it means to have true leadership. Not just about elders or ministers, but every single person of every age is doing their part. Here's the challenge. Are you doing your part? Do you know what your part is? Do you know what God wants you to do? Are you taking on your leadership capacity seriously? Look, moms, it could be raising your kids in the Lord. That could be the leadership that God wants you to do. Dads, it could be leading your family or teaching a class or serving in a ministry. Only you can answer that question. Only you are gonna stand before God and God will say either well done thou good and faithful servant or depart from me thou worker of iniquity. The last scripture that we're gonna look at is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and this is what I hope for me personally will reflect my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul writes this. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece, and they are spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. The word devotion here means addiction. It's kind of cool to think about. Have an addiction, an addiction to service, an addiction to leading in God's kingdom. Be an addictive servant. I want to live my life in such a way that people can say, you know what, look at Rick Bonifield. You see what he's doing? You see how he's living his life? Do that. Imitate that. Be like that. That's what I want to do because I want to be sold out for God. I want to follow him and lead for him in the best way possible. And that is the only way that we can grow this kingdom is if every person in this room has that same mentality. Here I am, God. Will you use me? Will you send me to do your will? And that is my prayer for you. And that is our vision that we are casting for the journey of of leading is that everyone will do their part in being a sold out leader. The number one way that that starts is if you're baptized into Christ. You cannot partake of the kingdom and be the leader that God wants you to be in any capacity without following Jesus first. And so if you are out of Christ this morning, what the Bible says, if you are willing to place your faith in the Lord and repent of your sins, confess him and be immersed in water, and walk and faithfully follow him the rest of your life, you can be used by God. 
And that is our prayer for you. I'm going to ask that you stand right now. We're going to pray. And if there's anyone who would like to take this opportunity to follow Jesus, you're going to be invited to do that now as we sing the song of invitation. God, I pray for the person in this room that has been questioning whether or not they should follow you. God, I pray that they would do that this morning, that they would follow you, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray.